Barbershop Podcast. And uh, we made it. We're here. Ryan Cannon. We had a great, great, great weekend, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We, we did. did. We, we had uh, a lot of recording. Yeah, we had a great, uh, great young band in here at Boxo Studio, uh, yeah. Monarch Project. They were uh, they were on uh, the the podcast. Enjoyed those guys. Love their sound. But uh, yeah, right at the end there on Sunday, you got hit hard, didn't you, brother? Oh, I got the flu. You got bad. the flu. Really, really bad. Yeah, and I've been recovering ever since. I'm still not 100. percent But there, no, but uh, 50 percent of Ryan is 90 percent of of, of <laughs> most human Thanks. beings. So Thanks. you're in good hands and yeah. uh, uh, wonderful uh, seasonal weather tonight. You know, raining. We always like to uh, you know touch on what the. It's been a tough, long, cold winter. Music has got us through each and every week. Every yeah. Wednesday, someone's come in and and brightened our week a little bit. And we love music. We love Hamilton music. We love this city. We love the history of what happened then and what's happening now. And we are blessed to have an awesome combination of both of those things in the studio tonight uh, with uh, a couple of really cool cats uh, from from Crawling King Snakes. I want to introduce uh, on my left, uh, Paul Wooten and uh, Steve Foster, who was in here uh, first time uh, as an individual uh, artist, uh, this time able to bring in Paul, learn a little yep. bit of history about like a really, really great band, a really part of, uh, important part of Hamilton history. We're going to listen to uh, what you got going on and hear some stories. How are you guys doing tonight? Good, good. 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 Uh, rainy night, it's a king snake traveling weather. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Dark and rainy is yep. the way you like it. Yep. So I, I want to start uh, at the beginning. Uh, we were we were chatting a bit and talking about uh, a seminal establishment here in Hamilton, Ontario, the Corktown Tavern. Been around for a long time, center of music for a great amount of time. It was Hamilton's kind of CBGBs, yeah, where you could see uh, the cutting edge bands and uh, you know and a wide variety of music in there. And uh, didn't really get into the story, so I'd like to pick it up there. You guys met at the, at Corktown. Yeah, um, I was playing with Matt McGarrett back then, and uh, Paul was dating someone that I went to high school with. And uh, I, I don't know, I ran into her somewhere. I went and saw the band a few times. I saw him at the Gown and Gavel, and I saw him at the Corktown. But I originally met Paul at uh, at the Corktown. So neither one of you were gigging that night. Um, I don't. I, no, I, I can't remember who was playing. Did you know each other as musicians at no, all at this no, point? No, no not really. <laughs> yeah. like I, I was uh, new into Hamilton. Um, I, I, I don't know if I... Yeah, I think I... I'm not sure if I'd moved here already or I don't, not. No, you weren't uh, living here yet, I but, don't think. Uh, I was spending a lot of time down here, and, and the Kingsnakes used to play through Hamilton all the so time you, in the day anyway. So. so tell me about the birth of, of Crawling Kingsnakes. And uh, and in the Reader's Digest format, and bring it up to speed. Okay. Well, the the band was formed in in London, uh, in uh, 1986, uh, um, and uh, we started traveling instantly. Our our first gig, we got booked on our first gig. We only knew like five or six songs before we got the booking because we filled in for a band uh, called Loaded and Rollin' who by the time they got around to their last set couldn't finish it because they were loaded and rolling. <laughs> uh, very apt name. So uh, we got up and did a you know a short set and they asked us to be the house band at the Brunswick Tavern in London. So we uh, we took the offer and spent the summer, you know, like developing a, a lot of tunes. and. Doing so you took a, a fairly like serious that. approach right off the bat. It wasn't sure. say this is a lark, let's just, you know, party it up. You're thinking, no, oh, this is a yeah, real opportunity. Yeah, it was funny stuff, though. We were getting, like, we were getting updates about our gigs and stuff in, like, magazines. Someone was sending, like, national magazines information about, because we'd have people light up down the street there. And... Uh, it, it was just funny how it took off, and then we had to stop doing that because there was so much demand to go out and play, like all over the place. So we couldn't be the house man there anymore. We had to go out and do a bunch of shows. So everyone was glad for that. And uh, but after about uh, three or four years, you know, there was uh, some unrest in the band, and you know, people. It wasn't it like anyone to, to move on. I think it was a little bit of frustration. We were held up by record labels for about eighteen months straight. And uh, like every time we we played, and we were playing almost every day, and there would be record labels there, and it was uh, there was a lot of pressure on people that only all they really wanted to do was get up and play, and this was getting turned into, you know, you had to be on everything every night, and I don't think some of them were equipped to take it. So, anyways, as it turned out, uh, I was in Hamilton, and a bunch of stuff happened, and we, I, I, Steve and I had already met. 
But <clears throat> right after the, the band broke up, we started talking. I think it was a house out in this region of the city. It was like a big, uh, some yeah, big old house. A, yeah, that. And we <laughs> sat at the kitchen table while everyone else was partying. We sat there for like a couple of hours and talked about stuff. And then that's another thing that we did for probably a, a couple of months. We sat at my kitchen table two or three nights a week and uh, wrote songs and put arrangements to everything and did better math on some of the other material. Right. You know? right. Basically stripped everything apart, put it back together in a lot better shape. Now, who are the who are the like the heavy players and your and your musical influences? Obviously, you shared a, a lot of, of of influences, either stuff you grew up with or who was playing right here and now at that time, which would have been what ninety, uh, eighty nine, I think yeah. eighty nine, ninety. I think yeah. we I, we were sitting around the kitchen table in eighty nine and uh, playing by ninety probably. But I mean, well, I mean, I don't know. We, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of roots music that we have in common, but. It was also a punk rock side to things too. I mean, Paul was in the centers before, long before the King Snakes. Um, but I mean, yeah, like you know, Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and definitely all that yeah. kind of stuff. We were both, you know, really into so Rolling Stones, obviously. From the Stones know, led it led <coughs> when when you got into the Rolling Stones, that led in you into so all of others. all of yeah. that. You know, yeah, the the blues and uh, R&B as and, well. And the theatrics, the lifestyle. Like, I mean, obviously yeah. it appealed to you that it's like you guys lived the life, right? Yeah, yeah it was, we, it was we had a pretty gypsy life for yeah. quite a long time. You know, yeah. we lived out of our van and just, you know, traveled all over like the place and ended up in... of being all about that, yeah. Good situations and bad situations, but like, you know, that's what, you know, stories come yeah, from. Yeah, and a certain flexibility to the sound. I imagine you played a lot of gigs with a, a lot of different genres oh, of music yeah. because yeah, yeah. you really have a crossover sound. It's like, you know, it, it could appeal to a lot of people who like good, honest, hard music. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we were always a little bit harder edge live than we were on our records, you know, naturally anyway. So, yeah. but yeah, but I mean, that whole period of time too, it was like, it, we were all about, just the band. I mean, we had jobs, but we would blow them out in a heartbeat, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. for a good game. Yeah, and it, it was when you got up in the morning that you were you were a musician, and that, and regardless of what you had to do during your day, that that's what you did. You know, the other stuff was like to pay the bills or yeah, exactly. whatever. And, and you know, quite honestly, we didn't think any other way for four or five years. Well, for me, almost ten years. You know, like I got up and I did that every day, and what I, what I had to do to pay the bills. And there were times where things were going really well, you know, like the band. Um, talk about things that you wanted to see in the in online, on well, uh, or it was an email I got from I think it was C I R R the, um, uh, they're you know trying to better Canadian musicians. And right. Stuff. Oh yeah, we're yeah, both yeah. members of it. They said the average income of a Canadian musician was seventy two hundred dollars. Yeah. Well. Twenty years ago, I figured out our average income was about fifty-two hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and 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 then people will say, "Well, you know, you're only working one night a week." It's like, well, it's not we like it falls out of the sky. We you're were, working we were, full we were playing, time. We were playing we were like three, a, a four lot. Nights yeah. a week. three, four, four nights sometimes. A week. And when you weren't playing, yeah. you were writing or lugging. You know, and we would go out. The thing is that we would go out on big blocks of shows and then come back so that we could go into a, the studio. Yeah, you know, it wasn't like we were looking to just like play and play and play. We would like block things together, go out and do a lot of shows, then we'd be able to work in the studio yeah. or develop material and then and, and set up more projects yeah. like that because we were recording albums. This was uh, a time before the labels got really interested in all the, you know, the Canadian bands type of thing and, and we were certainly there for a lot of that. So we were recording, we were doing everything independently. We were and the this first was pre-computer days, right? So it was yeah. like, you oh, understand, yeah. it's pretty easy to do things independently now yeah. when you have yeah. a, a, that thing right in front of you that can do your recording and can do your pub, you know publication and your printing. And yeah, there was absolutely but you guys zero had to of actually you, yeah, yeah. You, you, woodshed this stuff. You had right? to learn how to do all of that or where to go to get someone to be able to do that and what it would cost to. It was have never a part project. of it until the second record, be, until, we, until the mastering process. And that was the first time I ever saw a computer being used in the recording studio. Yeah. Before that, it was all tape. Like, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was an interesting time, though. I mean, we were one of the, we were the first band. We're the first band. Ham, indie band in Hamilton put out uh, a, a CD. Nice. Yeah. 
you know, so you were always confident about the, your, your mission as it was. You'd seen, because there had been some success stories out of Hamilton. Yeah, so oh, yeah. In your head, this was not a pie in the sky. Oh, no, it, no, and not only that, it, it's not just Hamilton. It's like what was going on in Ontario, yes. in southern Ontario, just the, the, boom, the boom musical scene, actually across Canada, but in particular, and in, in, from my standpoint, it was Ontario. Tons of, of great bands, and a lot of them got somewhere, but a lot of the ones that really paved the way for a lot of people, when I pick up these books about the Canadian music industry and you know like the history of it all I get is 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 complete books full of just they're just indie they're sorry they're just uh, really they're, they're record label company yeah. label company bands that in their early days the people that really pioneered this for all these people probably 75 to 80 percent of them never got anything other than their own satisfaction yep. out of it and other people whether they do it on purpose or whether they just take it but they take credos for what they really didn't do they were second and third in yeah. but they turn around and take the thank you we did yeah, all of this i'm but, glad you mentioned yeah. that because once in a while i still collect records and i'll buy uh or had in the past uh records from college radio stations right. when they when they went up to a digital format yeah. and i pull stuff out like the bin tangs or people who are like out of mississauga or oakville and like in ontario and yeah. this was really good music that you knew that it didn't get past that little bubble right. of, of college radio in southern Ontario somewhere, but the process had begun. Well, that was the era that. of change of heart and all that. Yeah. I mean, we were on the same track as them. We half the time we played across the street. From We'd each run other. into them so many times <laughs> at a gas station, like a gas station on the four hundred one at three o'clock in the morning. Everybody's going for coffee and stuff. And yeah. it's like, hey. If you're out of province, uh, the certain parts of the four hundred one, you just drive, and then there's a beacon every once in a while where you can get food and gas and go to the yeah. bathroom, and that's like the watering hole yep. for musicians <laughs> at three in the morning. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and truck drivers, lonely, lonely, underpaid people. But th those guys were a good example of that whole yeah. you know, of a band that kicked the door open for a lot of other people, and they never got major label success. You know, yeah. I mean, but I mean, the venues they played got bigger and bigger all the time, and they sold yeah. tons of indie records. And, 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 and I have to say, a lot of these bands were not just bands that were together for a few months and split up. These guys were a lot of a lot of these bands were together for years and years. You know, it was all about writing the material being original, not playing a bunch of covers, and presenting it to people in public, and it was certainly good enough to be as good as anything Anything else. in the world, That's absolutely. Right. Well, we're going we're gonna to hear a little sample of this. We're going to get on to some of the, uh, some of the music that Crawl and King Snakes uh, has produced and is producing. Uh, we've got something, uh, a, a, little, uh, a little teaser, a little special something. Um, you know, uh, there's been quite a few songs written about the Donnellys in, uh, in Southern Ontario. It's quite a yeah. famous story. Um, any any uh, lead-in you want to let us uh, in on uh, in regards to the uh, Ballad of Will Donnelly, which is the first track we're going to play? Well, being from London, uh, that's always been, I'm, I'm uh, you know, like a history buff of sort, especially things like the Donnellys and that type of thing's always attracted me. So, And I, actually, I was reading a book by a guy, from, a guy in Hamilton wrote this book about the Donnelly family, and uh, it just inspired me to... Um, you know, put a tune together, you know, write a song, kind of encapsulating the, the, the legend, the story, you know, and, and put it into a modern format. Uh, that's an understatement. Kick-ass rock and roll, great <laughs> band. Crawling King Snakes here, Ballad of Will Donnelly of BarbershopPodcast.com. Will Donnelly came from Luke Hill, up on the Huron track. Now his life is history, but it don't mean it's fact
Ballad of Will Donnelly. Crawling King Snakes here on barbershoppodcast.com. Kind of famous story, made more famous by the uh, the great Steve Earle, and you had a little insight, in the, and in fact, you were pretty seminal. And I've used that word twice. Very, I heard yeah. Out. yeah. Uh, you, you, were, you were a big part <laughs> in him coming up with that song, I guess. Justice in Ontario, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. I was in the process, just in the, the, the early stages of trying to put together the ballad of Will Donnelly, and um, we'd met Steve year, from years before, and he was traveling through a lot. And we got together with him when he came into uh, London. And I was telling him about the Donnellys, and he'd never heard of them before. So I was, you know, telling him what I was working on, all of that. And then a couple of days later, he came down to the Hamilton area and, and met a, a bunch of bikers down here who had legal problems. Uh, and he must have been asking them about the Donnellys because, like, he tied to, tied the two together and basically made justice in Ontario. So, and that's uh, it's kind, kind of, of a neat little eh? uh, little yeah. little uh, notch in the uh, in the stick of life, as, oh, yeah. as you would say. So you meet a lot of great great people with a life in music, and I think the yeah. great thing about life in music is it sorts out the scum pretty quickly and the phonies. It's self evident after a while. Oh, yeah. What uh, you know. This is going to be floating around the internet for a while. What are you know for the young guys or someone who's like you know who are these guys and start now digging in about your history? What's like the kind of one thing that sticks with you if you're the old band and the rock and roll retirement home and some kids saying you know what the fuck you know what's what's the thing about life in music that sets you apart? Like what's it? What's the thing that keeps you coming back every time you say this is this is not worth it? This is painful. This is this is taking me away from where I want to go, and then you realize that's where I have to be. Is it's yeah. Well, we did a show a few months ago back with uh, Lou, um, Lou's Control, and Mr. And, Molinero, and, and he said, you know, it's got to be, isn't it? It's, it's you do it because it it's it's fun. Well, you know what? It isn't necessarily fun, but what it is is you love to do it. And sometimes it's not fun, but you do it anyways because you just love to do it. Yeah, you know. And that's, yeah. a, I mean, that's that that question kind of caught me off guard a bit. But thinking about it later, I realized that you know, there's lots of moments where things don't. Everything doesn't have to be fun. Yeah. It just has to be good, though. You know, yeah. it has to be something out of it. And and that's why I love doing it. You know, yeah. it, it's I, I like to do that. You know. And I, I think probably both you guys, to a certain extent, are seekers. And I think a lot of musicians, especially writers. Yeah. Are seekers, yes. you know, and can't imagine not doing it. Yeah, at any well, level the, I, or any where, yeah. <laughs> you know. There's a truthfulness to it, even if you're not singing. Or there's no lyrics involved, but it's just the music. It strikes me that something can be f- contrived, or it can be honest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's just but sound. So I think the whole concept from the from the beginning with the Crawling King Snakes was that. We were going to write material. We were going to record it and put it out, and we we're and, and develop as songwriters and, and artists. And that's always been a continuum. With we, we're not just a band that yeah you know that picks up a bunch of stuff and does it. We, we Steve writes and I write. We write together. The band like uh, another thing is what arrangements with with Greg and and Mike. You know, like those guys are very good at. Hearing yeah. what we're trying to express because of the amount of time that we've been together, and there's a magic involved with that. Yes, you know? and a real a sweet political uh, spot where yeah. it's like you know what? There's no egos involved here. We're all chasing the same thing. So if I hear something, I'm going to be succinct about what I hear, what I suggest, and you try it, and it gets done, and it's yeah. it's for, it's for the better. And when you're in a situation where there's even one person in the band doing it for the wrong reason yeah. or that you have to walk on eggshells around it's it's the kiss of death isn't it yeah well, I, I think everyone in, in the band is just trying to uh, they want to uh, <clears throat> convey the, the basic idea that you're trying to that we're, we're expressing you know but add to that not just like the same old part you know there's always uh, extensions without it being and, and, and we're, we're talking about uh, uh, about digital and analog type of thing we're I mean, we can function in a digital environment, but a lot of our thinking and the way things come from is is, is not only analog, but it's interaction between us in in person. Yeah, you know, in a studio. 
Well, we'll try to get a little. Uh, we'll try to get a little taste of that if I can get you to, to suit up and pull the yep. mics up close and 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 this is what we try to do here every week at Barbershop Podcast. Uh, you can't always get out to a show. There's so many people who have every good intention, myself being one of them, of going to a show, but something comes up or you don't feel like it, and I just gotta ask that the next time that happens. Go with your gut. Go out and see some live music because any kind of cramp you feel or any kind of ill feeling will be washed away if you go out and you see live music. You know, Not only are you supporting you know, the establishments that support live music and the musicians, but you're going to really help yourself. Well, we're going to get a little, uh, little bit of something, a little crawling kink snakes right here at Barbershop Podcast anytime you're ready. Yep, this is off our, uh, off our uh, soon-to-be-released album this year called uh, The Lost Years, but this is called I Ain't Nothing Like You. It's really hard to tell what makes a man a man. Well, I'm not going to stand in your line all day. Don't sit and take it to the prize with time. I ain't nothing like you, boy. The route I take is a long, hard climb. I ain't nothing like you. It's never easy when you do things your own way. But it sure sets you free. Take the course in life you want to day by day. Let it set you free Well, all I think you'll ever hear is blah, blah, blah I ain't nothing like you, boy A dollar's worth of groceries on a credit card I ain't nothing like you It's hard to really tell what makes a man a man But I ain't nothing like you, boy Taking on a Sony plan I ain't nothing like you Never easy Cause in life you want to be by day Let it set you free All right Crawling King Snakes right here at barbershoppodcast.com each and every Wednesday, 8 p.m. or thereabouts on Justin TV. <laughs> Just about. Yeah, we, we, I think we how many, <laughs> what, what do you think our less. accuracy on time ratio is there, Ryan? Is it? Uh, it's pretty slim. Yeah, I'd say about 12, <laughs> no, 8, 8% maybe. Very, 
very generous. Yeah, no, it's we do our best, you know. Not even close. People, I think we've had like maybe four episodes out of what are we at? Seventy seven. Seventy seven. Yeah. Yeah, but right. four, four out of four, four on time. You know, we're getting there. Well, not really. We had one but, early. <laughs> yeah, we did have one early. Yeah. That kind of makes up for it. Yeah. But you can catch us anytime. It's up forever on YouTube. Okay, uh, subscribe to our YouTube page once a week when there's a new episode. It'll appear on your uh, on your feed, and you know you want that. Uh, iTunes, if you're working, uh, you know, some sort of job, or you're out in a bicycle or on the treadmill, barbershop podcast on iTunes. Put it in you know, on your iPod or your phone. Listen to it. Great stuff. Uh, we're on Stitcher Radio or at our website, barbershoppodcast.com. So you guys got a uh, you got a big rock and roll show coming up. Yeah, on May twenty third at the Corktown yeah. uh, with Black and Red and Sinburn. You gotta like a show with those guys, you know, and you gotta got a shout out for Ig, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Iggy, you know, friend of the show. Great supporter, great guy. Sinburn, also a great band. You know, all the guys of Black and Red are just smoking. It's like top notch LA cock rock yeah. as good as you can get anywhere and we have right here in hamilton ontario and you guys i mean that's a great show corktown tavern and that's may 23rd and uh, get your butt over there yeah. um for songwriters uh we all get influenced as, as we grow older we're more exposed to different types of music and, and and different artists who are some of the great uh, unheralded songwriters. Again, people kind of tap into this show from time to time. Uh, throw out a name for, for me, each one of you, of a songwriter you think, man, this guy is a great songwriter and maybe people need to look up on, on the internet. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge uh, Paul Westerberg fan. Like, I just, there's something about, it's just straight to the point, you know, guitar rock, yeah. you know, straight out of the garage. That kind of stuff. I mean, I like you know, I like so many different things, and in this band, there's there's so many different influences with roots and and punk and garage and all kinds of stuff. So, but that songwriting wise, he's one that definitely sticks out for me. Cool, cool. How about you, Paul? Um, I, other than the, yourself, no, I mean, Steve I, Foster. I mean, <laughs> when you're in your own band, this is the thing. All the time. Well, yeah, you're I, in your own. Let's put yeah. it this way: I've, I've I grew up listening to like a lot of great songwriters some of the greatest and everything and because i write songs now i try not to like get planted into one thing too yeah. tight because yeah. then i start drawing yeah influences off of that yeah so and you know um it's been a long time since i haven't been in a mode i've been like trying like picking up new instruments and stuff yeah. like that over the last year and a half and that's also involved me in like writing material like i've got more sets of chords and stuff than i have so the writing process has changed to work on them yeah. so i've been in this yeah. mode kind of like writing learning mode for going on two years now so i i, I do listen to things but you know it's it's yeah. weird things like the last week i've had on the last month or so i've been listening to um santana very first oh, santana yeah. album yeah you know with <laughs> Just Those funny. early works are always great. They say, you know, somehow this person got to that second or third album that was promoted enough that I was aware of it as a teenager, but it was quite often an album that I'm barely aware of that right. that was brilliant, that allowed him to get to the, the one that I was exposed to. Yeah. So again, you know, if there's an artist. And this what I saw, I think it was Stu Jeffries or someone posted on Facebook, original ad from Q107 when it first came on the air, and it was like album oriented rock right. you know and the promise and the delivery at that time that that's in fact what it was is you got whole album sides or you got deep cuts on a record yep. that weren't just played in the top 40 rotation and i remember being a kid on the beach in fort erie drinking beer and smoking dope and that was you know it was yep. like inc an incredible thing all the fm radio i ever listened to never had any commercial stuff yeah. on it yeah. at all you know it was album oriented materials you yeah. know and this is now it's gone full cycle that the internet is the place you have to go to get yeah, this to get now that, because yeah. everything else has become so, so commercial. Yeah. 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 Well, we're gonna play another one of your awesome ditties. All right. Tell me about the song I Can't Pretend. Uh, it's, um, Steve sings it, um, uh, and wrote it, and it's uh, it's self-explanatory. 
Yeah. yeah, it pretty well fills you in and all it's the details. It's one of those songs that just came right away. Yeah, I was it's actually from the heart. Yeah. yeah, I was working for somebody and I wrote it at the side of the stage. Wow. I was working for Ian Thomas and he said something and it gave me an idea. And by the time he was done, the song, the lyrics were done. Yeah, and if you would have put know. it off and said, "I'll write that," I, after, yeah, it would have been, have been one of those gone. things that went into the ether. Yeah. Well, so. here it is. This is, <laughs> this is how this shit happens. And of course, a lot of work, a lot of hammer and tong. After yeah. that point, to after get it to this I got point. with these guys with it, yeah, it went through some changes before it, you know. But well, you get to hear it, and it's coming out in the new Crawling Kick Snakes CD album release. But you get to hear it right now, barbershoppodcast.com.
crawling king snakes. I can't pretend. A real what we call a TH and B sound. Um, um, that kind of rock and roll is is very definitely a Hamilton sound. You yeah. know what's what are some of the the, the great TH and B artists? They've influenced you. You well, played with a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, the, the Florida Razors, of course, and Teenage Head and the Shakers. I mean, I went to Westdale High School, so I mean, it was it part of. Yeah. The they were big, almost uh, there with the athletes in the hall. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I, I don't know. Everybody I knew was sneaking into gliders in the West End. You know, it, by grade Catch ten or eleven. Catch the Trouble Boys, kick the, yep. the Trouble doors Boys. Down. Yep. Yeah, yeah. All those bands were a huge influence on me because I was just starting to get into my first bands then too. So, yeah. you know. Everybody at school is going ooh and on. Ah, you want to do that too. And, and, and you being you being from London, which is like got its huge, almost you know, also vibrant music scene. Yeah. What kind of rep did Hamilton have? I always had a good one. You know, like the bands that came through from Hamilton. You know, like were. Uh, I mean, everyone knew Teenage Head was from Hamilton, but uh, some of the other bands that came into town, like once, especially once we started playing in Hamilton a lot, we, we you know we ran into. You know, became friends with Tom Wilson, the Florida Razors, and the Trouble Boys, and Guitar Mikey, and you know all these people, and and we brought a lot of them down to London, you know, to 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 do shows at like Call the Office and places like mm -hmm. that. So we had, we we imported a lot of acts into London from Hamilton because you know we met a lot of people here that we had common ground with, and that's the reason why I'm here in Hamilton. Yeah, well, there's a lot of good heads in Hamilton, that's for sure, and there's only one really good head shop in Hamilton, and that's where heads meet. And if you want to get yourself a, an awesome uh, piece of art that also serves to uh, smoke, uh, you know, any kind of uh, holistic native uh, produced product, something that's natural and, and, and is good for you, um, you've got to go see James at where heads meet. Heads meet at... Uh, Ottawa and Cannon in Hamilton. And that's just uh, south of Cannon on Ottawa Street on the east side. You'll see his sign. Uh, go in there and check it out. He's got uh, a, a shop that's jammed with uh, some cool musical instruments, We've got some native art, We've got some uh, many, many different devices and to. Uh, to, to smoke uh, and uh, and a lot of uh, interesting uh, periodicals, magazines, books, T-shirts, dolls. It's if you wanted to just spend half an hour looking around, you'd be hard pressed not to leave without picking something up. It's a cool shop. Go see our friend James there at where heads meet, uh, Ottawa, and Canada, and Hamilton, Ontario. Um, all right, guys. Um, I gotta hear some more. I gotta hear all some right, more, more live music because that's the treat here at Boxo Studio. Is not only do you have to come in and talk about the good old days, but you get to play it too. That's right. So, that's what do you got for us now? Uh, it's called "It's Hard." I uh, I wrote it a lot. I wrote it quite some time ago. I wrote it with Tom Wilson, and then uh, Colin oh. Cripps came along and added a bridge to it. You know, it was a work in progress for a little while. That. The end result, you know, it's like it, it's much different than how it started, but I, I, it fit the King Snakes vibe. Beauty. So I decided like, we should get this one on the record too. Got it right here at barbershoppodcast.com. <laughs> Hard to lose. 
Music City getting hard to lose an hour. Why do I dream alone? It's hard to give when you're so cold on the shoulder. Every day puts me deeper, makes me older. Under your spell At an all-night picture show The one that won't let it go Now give me love Give me soul like Johnny Cash Give me thrills like Dylan's billion dollar bash I pick my words and let these TVs flicker out of sight why do I live alone it's hard to give when you're so cold on the shoulder Puts me deeper, makes me older. It's hard to give when you're so cold on the shoulder. Every day puts me deeper, makes me older. Balladeering at its finest. <laughs> oh, love it. Here at barbershoppodcast.com, the best in Hamilton music and musicians each and every week. At barbershoppodcast.com, you're going to want to check us out. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us to the ends of the earth because it's a good trip. Guarantee you're going to have a good time. <laughs> uh, Ryan Cannon. How's it going in there tonight? <laughs> it's going good. You caught, <laughs> you caught me off guard. I caught you off guard. Yeah, I wasn't I ready for that. Well, I know, a little bit of left field. I'm usually only like once in the middle, at the beginning, at the end, and that's it. Yeah, and no, we got a little, little shout out twice, to uh, yeah. to uh, Gary Greenland, who's given us yeah, a, definitely. A, a big hand, a uh, big yeah. help tonight. And uh, Gary used to work as a uh, radio engineer. And uh, he's yes, he's, he's been an amazing help tonight, especially since I'm incapacitated and still somewhat. Yeah, because we we kept getting more stuff, and like he, Ryan's locked back there, and finally he's like, you know, I'm doing a lot of shit back here now. He's like, I got, it's I got, hard it's, now. it's getting tough. I need like two extra hands. Yeah. It's like, well, fair enough. We need a staff. <laughs> <laughs> We're building it here, at barbershop podcast, yeah. and you can't do that. I mean, it blows me away that someone can. Watch us right now, live in Australia or yeah, New Zealand, yeah, or you know, across yeah. the other side of the world yep. in high definition, high fidelity. We can do it for you know, same with a good creative studio. You don't, you know, when you came in, it was an expensive, arduous process. Oh, yeah, and there was a great advantage to that because you went in lean and you knew what you had to do and you didn't fuck around and waste time. And it's and it often captured that tightness and that desperation yeah well of, it's like steve has a studio in 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 dundas and uh like a recording studio but i've often kind of thought it would be really nice to be able to do live podcasts out of there just mm -hmm. like us working new material or you know doing a doing a a, a set with you know yeah. some some whoever wanders in yeah i i've room. often yeah. thought like that whole austin city limits thing but yeah. done on a small regional scale you know, across the country where I could go click on a CBC link where there's 35 places that are all playing a yeah, kitchen, a kitchen party, you know, and yeah. then I can pick mine. Because there's real music. And yep. There's real music out there, and it's no different than real food. You know, the shitty food is just ruining your life and ruining your body, and the real music is there. <laughs> That's right. You know, yep. and, yep. It's, and the only reason that shitty music can survive is because it's on the backs of 
the real music. Yeah. And when you get a whole generation who've never been exposed to real music, I, I like the numbers that goes with the the, the echo or the, the 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 baby boomers kids. There's enough of these kids who are starting to crave some some authenticity to their music. And even though, you know, you're, and I won't mention any names, but the people who are very successful on Twitter are often the very worst musicians. So I could, yeah. would say anyone who has uh, got more than a million followers on Twitter probably is someone you shouldn't be listening to. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, it's a, they're in it for the wrong reason, yeah, you know, because yeah. yep. it's, 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 it's a format that enlightens, it educates, it, 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 it comforts. And uh, I'm a big believer in it, and I'm a big believer in, in, in Hamilton, Ontario. And, and the places like this ain't Hollywood. Lou Molinaro and Glenn Fallman, and Becky and, and uh, Carl and everyone down there is staff. It's a place that, that features and supports real live music. And uh, I had the pleasure. I went down you did, at a show a little while ago, and I did one of my classic iPhone videos. Yeah. And I like doing that, especially if, if, if it's not jammed to the rafters because you can walk. It's a nice high stage, so you can yeah. walk up to the front and not really get it anyone's uh, way. But you were, you were playing a smoking set, and I did one of those classic Kevin Barber iPhone videos. Is there a chance we could uh, you could dig that up and spin it for me, Ryan Cannon? Yeah. All right. <laughs> this is uh, something that's going to be off the new album as well, Shiny yep. Karma, yeah, sure, which yeah, I Karma. love, you know, a very descriptive song title like that. Anything you want to set us up about Shiny Karma? Um. No, not no. really. Good. <laughs> I, mean, I'm sure yeah, I totally get that. Um, I can say um, your your video is on our website as well. There you go. Yeah. There you go. And that is uh, crawlingkingsnakes.com. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And it'll be on barbershoppodcast.com. Follow the links and tell your friends about this show. If you're watching and you're having a good time, and there's a lot of Hamilton history, and there's a lot of great music on uh, our past episodes, and we've got to whack them on there. But right now, uh, filmed by yours truly. Uh, on a uh, telephone camera uh, at This Ain't Hollywood, Shiny Karma. Crawling King Snakes on Barbershop Podcast. The new album is called Shiny Karma. Come next week for my spoken word part. Tell me, Ready? drummer. <laughs>
bit of shiny karma from yep. Crawling King Snakes, one of Hamilton's great rock and roll outfits. Be sure to check them out at uh, the Corktown Tavern, 175 Young Street in Hamilton, Ontario on May 23rd, which is a Friday, Friday, Friday night. night, and that is the Canada's traditional night to party. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we like Saturdays, but we can hardly wait, so Fridays yeah. is where Friday's it pops loose. Now. So come to the Corktown Tavern in Hamilton, Ontario. See Crawling King Snakes. They are full value rock and roll outfit. Big, important part of Hamilton history and a great pleasure having them in here tonight. Guys, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, thanks for having and, us. And uh, no, great sounding. It's fun to do. Yeah, no, it's, and I'm happy to have done it. And uh, for those of you who enjoyed the show, check us out next week. We've got... I was going to say one thing. When I first came to Hamilton, yeah. weekend started on Thursdays. Really? That I remember that. I do remember that. I do remember that. That's we used true. to do that yeah. because the weekend gas stations would close Thursday. at 6 o'clock on Sunday. <laughs> you couldn't do anything on Sunday, so we started on Thursdays. Yeah. Well, don't let that stop you. Here it is Wednesday night. Start partying. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. From Barbershop Podcast, from Ryan, for Ryan Cannon yep. and uh, Greg, Gary Greenland and the uh, Crown yeah. King Snakes. Have a great night. See you next week.